Good afternoon, everybody. This is Ben Powers coming at you from the Commander's Voice. A uh, very special guest today. My guest is Professor Hal Sasabowski, uh, coming to us from England. He is the great grandson of General Stanislaw Sasabowski, who is the commander of the first Polish independent parachute brigade during World War II. So, Hal, how are, how are you this evening? I'm fine, Ben. And may I say what an absolute pleasure it is to be talking to you tonight. Uh, and we're really excited to have you here. So, uh, for the audience, the listeners, viewers, I first. Uh, heard about Professor Sosabowski when he gave a discussion about the general a few weeks ago via Facebook and it was he gave a very fascinating lecture about the Battle of Arnhem uh, during Operation Market Garden and his great grandfather's brigade's participation in that battle. So it's a, a great chunk of airborne history. It doesn't get a lot of play compared to the big airborne divisions. Market Garden, although you have uh, books like uh, Bridge Too Far, uh, things of that nature. That doesn't seem to get as much airtime compared to the jump into Normandy Operation Neptune. Uh, is there any reasons that you might think that's the case, uh, Hal? I don't know, because the um, thing about Market Garden is that that's the big para battle of um, World War II. And um, quite often the poles are seen as very much subordinated and very much peripheral, which, which is a shame because they jumped in the same as everyone else. Polish blood was spilled. Um, they found themselves in an almost impossible situation. But of course, as we know, um, it was a very convenient place to put the blame for the failure of Market Garden onto the Poles in general and my great grandfather in particular. Now, one thing that I think is really interesting, a lot of people might have questions, well, how did a Polish brigade even wind up as part of, you know, 1st British Airborne Division? So I think what's really fascinating, and I'd like to take a step back, because your grandfather was involved in fighting the Germans from, from literally day one. He was in command of a regiment, was he not, when the Germans invaded Poland in 1939? Yes, he was the officer in command of the children of Warsaw. And what happens is he was taken prisoner, uh, sent to a prisoner of war camp from where he promptly escaped, and via several European cities, ended up in um, on the Alderpool, which is a ship going across to um, Britain, with I think about 4,000 other Poles. And um, the British didn't know where to put them. So what they did, they sent them all to Scotland. And it really was a ragtag rabble of a um, army, not even an army, just a lot of soldiers, um, and they were divvied up, divided up between uh, General Maciek and General Pashkiewicz. They took the cream of the crop. And what was left was for General Sosabowski. And um, he literally pulled them together and made a um, army in waiting out of them. And after some uh, consideration, realized that in order to free Warsaw, they had to go via the shortest, the shortest way. And he alighted on the idea of forming a parachute brigade. And from that point on, that was what he did. And he molded all these soldiers into what we now know as the first um, Polish independent parachute brigade. And the, the shortest way, that became somewhat of a motto of the brigade, did it not? It did. It was the title of one of his books. And um, the Gapper, the Eagle, um, designed by Sar Sergeant Valentinov Valentinovich, um, that was the symbol of the brigade, uh, literally dropping on the unsuspecting prey from the sky. Um, that was the, um, the model for liberating Warsaw. Now, as you said, your grandfather, uh, great grandfather, excuse me, he kind of hit upon the idea that, you know, vertical envelopment would be the way the troopers got back into Poland. And that germ of an idea, he really built that from the ground up. He had to do some convincing. He wasn't directed by his Polish chain of command or by the, uh, the Allied Command Authority to create an airborne capability. He really scrounged to turn his brigade into an airborne organization, did he not? He did. And I think a lot of the um, underlying philosophy was let's just keep the Poles out of trouble send them to Scotland. It's almost like giving a child a colouring book and some crayons to play with. And I don't think they were taken very seriously. They were completely under-resourced, for example. They got whatever resources the British didn't want. And, um, but yes, you're quite right. He sort of used what he had and turned his men into a um, dedicated parachute force. And um, that was one that parachuted into Arnhem. Now, one thing I also found fascinating was that during the entire time the brigade was training up, it was, uh, you know, gaining capability while it was in uh, Scotland, certain members of the brigade or certain members of the 
I don't know if the proper term is the Polish Free Army or uh, other Polish troopers that were in Britain were actually re-entering Poland in clandestine operations by parachute as well, weren't they? They were. They were called the Chichoczemni, the Islands in the Unseen, and they were busily going into Warsaw to do various bits of underground work all along. So you're quite right, and that's often not written about, but it was a very um, real thing that happened. Now, did they have a relationship with the brigade or were they run by special operations executive? How, how were those operations handled? I think they were run, um, they were run by um, a special operations executive. But I think once the brigade got into training and developed their courses, they were often uh, trained by the brigade, as were many non-Polish paratroopers. Now, it seems as we go through, the, the brigade becomes a more capable combat force. The Allies re-enter Europe in the, uh, the summer of 1944. Airborne operations sort of prove their worth during Operation Neptune. And the commander of the British Airborne Forces, General Browning, he's kind of looking around, looking for more capability. He starts eyeing the Polish Brigade, does he not? And I, I don't want to cast aspersions on the, on the general's reputation, but the Brigade was always training to jump into Warsaw, liberate their country. And they, General uh, Sosabowski, as I understand, felt he had a deal that the brigade would not be used in other combat operations other than to jump into Warsaw. But the British really wanted to start using that capability in other operations as the summer wore on. Is that kind of a correct interpretation or am I being too unforgiving? Yeah, it's not an aspersion at all. It's cold hard fact. I think um, the Poles were left to their own devices to get on with things to keep them out of trouble. But at some point it was recognized that they were a useful resource and a fighting force to be used, at which point um, General Browning did want to use them for whatever purpose he wanted to use them for. And eventually what they were subordinated to the British Airborne. And so how, how did your, uh, your great grandfather kind of take that relationship when he sort of lost the independence in independent parachute brigade? Well, he, he was a soldier, so he knew how to obey orders. Um, and I think he was to, to a certain degree misled a little bit. Um, the underlying um, aspiration was always to liberate Warsaw. Um, and we can talk about the, the, the realistic nature of a, a single brigade liberating Warsaw later on if you want to. But the reality was um, they, they genuinely believed they would be liberating Warsaw at some point and that anything else was just a diversion in the meantime. And I, actually, you, you raise a great point that I'd actually like to explore a little bit now, because in, in addition to this Polish Airborne Brigade, there were other Polish forces operating in support of the Allies. Was that not correct? Yes, there was General Maciek's um, tanks, um, who worked a lot in Holland, and various other um, outfits as well. So conceivably, if there's a point where you use a brigade as a spearhead to jump into Warsaw, there was probably going to be some level of organized resistance that they could link up with and form around the combat power of the brigade. And that could sort of be a vanguard to a larger allied effort if that was ever the decision that Warsaw was going to be liberated. Was that sort of the idea? It was. See, the, the Polish AK, the Warsaw Underground, which was literally tens of thousands, one of which incidentally was the son of the general, Major Sosabowski. At some point they said, when we're going to do the Warsaw Uprising, please send a brigade in because um, their intervention will be key and monumental. And of course, the brigade didn't go in. Um, and again, many historians will mention about the likelihood of a brigade, even with the help of the Warsaw, up, uh, the Warsaw Underground, being able to do very much. But it almost doesn't matter. That was what the brigade was told. And they felt that they were training in order to liberate Warsaw from the oppressors. So um, they were misled to a greater or lesser degree, probably greater. Yes, sir. And I also understand there was a degree of, uh, you know, real politic, if you will, about the strategic situation, because you've got airlift that's going to need to, you know, travel from England across Western Europe, allow these troopers to jump onto Warsaw. Those aircraft are not going to make it back to their home airfields. So where's the closest allied landing fields? Probably somewhere in the Soviet Union, who probably aren't too excited about the idea of Poland liberating itself, since Poland had always been kind of covetously eyed by the Soviet Union as territory that they would like to control. I, am I simplifying yes. that too much, or is that actually uh, kind of accurate? I, and I don't think the plans ever got to be even that well thought through. I don't know that there was ever um, any plan in anyone's mind, apart from the Poles, that the brigade would liberate Warsaw. 
um, they weren't taken seriously until they were taken seriously, at which point they were seen as a resource that Browning could use elsewhere. I don't know that um, Browning ever really thought they would be uh, sent into Poland. Yes, sir. And that sums it up perfectly to bring us back to the summer of 1944. So now General Browning has the brigade as a resource to augment the 1st British Airborne Division. And for folks who have not seen the movie, you know, uh, A Bridge Too Far or read the book, uh, could you kind of give a very quick summation of what the strategic and tactical plans were and how the brigade fit into those? Well, essentially, um, this was a, um, a, uh, a plan that was devised in uh, a week. It was a successor to Operation Comet, which was um, its predecessor, effectively parachuting in 35,000 troops in order to catch seven key bridges um, over the Rhine, um, hold those bridges until 30 Corps, which were the um, traveling armor, could cross those bridges up to the bridge at Arnhem, turn right into the industrial heartland of Germany, capture all the factories, which would stop the um, German war machine and end the war by Christmas. And this was in September. So that was the idea. But almost as I explain it, I can imagine all the listeners or the viewers thinking, well, seven bridges, okay. What happens if they miss one of those bridges? That's the point. Every single bridge had to be taken and held. And there were a whole load of reasons why um, there was no levels of redundancy. The road was at some point a single lane. Um, 30 Corps had to move um, to schedule, which they weren't able to do. But above all else, um, Dutch Underground had indicated that there were several divisions of um, SS um, Panzers, um, by which time there was so much momentum in this um, plan that um, although they brought hard intelligence that there were um, these um, Panzer divisions resting and refitting, literally, because at Arnhem nothing was happening, um, that they were just ignored. And um, the reality was um, you had lightly armed paras ending up on some very, very angry SS um, operatives because they, um, they were there to rest and refit. It was the von Frunsberg, the Hohenstaufen, the Grenadiers, and um, so on and so forth. So they were literally outnumbered by huge, huge um, numbers of German armoured assets who were very, very angry. And um, we all know what happened then. Yes, sir. So there's a sort of a sense that, as you've kind of laid out here, literally every phase of the operation had to go correctly. There was no redundancy to be able to take up the slack if something went wrong. But it seems also that the Allies did not take the credibility of the German forces too seriously after the success they had through the summer of 44 in France. And they seemed to wish away the idea that there could be any determined resistance left or that there would be difficulties if the drop zones were too far away from the objectives or if uh, the aircraft were considered more important than the ground tactical plan. And it was almost like a comedy of errors that built on itself. Uh, was the original plan for the Poles to jump closer to their objectives or more uh, earlier in the operation than they ultimately did? Or were they always sort of a strategic reserve that was going to be committed if there was a problem? No, they were supposed to jump in, I think it was day three, um, which again was one of my great grandfather's um, problems. He said, um, an, air an airborne operation is not a purchase by instalments. I, by day three, they know we're coming. So what's the point of having parachutists? Second point is, um, they were dropped, I think eight, they were supposed to be, um, uh, or Royal Ro Ro troops dropped eight miles from the drop zone which is ludicrous. I mean, eight miles is a long, long way to get from where you drop to the target. And the point was there were lots of various um, reasons why they couldn't drop closer to them. Um, the poles were delayed by fog. And again, no, no sort of provision was made for this sort of delay. And once they um, were dropped, they were dropped south of the river and their supplies were dropped north of the river. So anything that could have gone wrong did go wrong. The boats that they were supposed to cross the river on weren't there, so they ended up crossing on rubber boats in the night. And as soon as the um, Germans realised where they were, of course, um, they lost, I think, 100 troops um, in the river crossing um, because they were just being strafed by machine guns. Now, your great-grandfather had a reputation as a professional soldier, as you've indicated earlier, but not only did that mean that he was willing to follow his orders and do what had to be done, but he was also 
one to speak up against a ludicrous, ludicrous, excuse me, tactical plan, and also try to protect the lives of his troopers from being needlessly wasted. And I believe that he had a, a couple sharp words with the British chain of command as the operation unfolded. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Yes, I mean, it was more than a couple of um, uh, words. He, he said that the mission can't succeed. There's just too many reasons it can go wrong, point one. Um, second of all, he just um, realized very quickly that there were all these, 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 um, these holes. Every single step in the um, operation had to succeed. And if one failed, everything failed. He was very, very fond of his, um, his soldiers because he sort of brought them up, if you will, over a period of um, some years by that point himself and turned them from effectively a rabble into um, a, a small army. So he was, he just, and he also said, if we know how important this bridge is, what of the Germans? Do you not think they know how important it is? And, and no one seemed to get it. And I think this is it's very common when a lot of resource and a lot of momentum has got into a particular operation for um, anyone who questions it to be seen as part of the enemy. If you're not with us, you're against us, rather than having that very necessary um, self-reflection about whether something could or should carry on because um, you've identified in hindsight that there's reasons why it shouldn't. Yes, sir. And so for those who may not be familiar with how this battle turned out, six of the seven bridges were successfully taken, but the seventh and final most important bridge on the northern part of the route at Arnhem was never successfully taken. The Germans successfully counterattacked and the overall operation failed. And ultimately, whenever an operation fails, people start looking around for a scapegoat. And unfortunately, the Poles found themselves in the crosshairs, did they not, sir? They did. And I... There was, um, it wasn't just sort of um, barrack room talk. Um, what was fed back to Montgomery was the Poles, um, he, he said in the cipher, um, the Polish brigade were not keen to fight if it meant risking their own lives, which just isn't true. The reality was they were, and they did, even though they weren't fighting to liberate Warsaw and they suffered um, losses the same as everyone else. And I think it was just too convenient because let's not forget um, they were the only non-English speaking, non-native English speaking part of that operation. And it's just really convenient to throw it all onto the Eastern Europeans. Um, my great grandfather didn't speak good English. He was a, a fighting soldier. So he was turning up to the Wahlberg conference in a dirty uniform, um, obviously very stressed. Whereas Browning was there resplendent in his, um, his um, beautifully pressed uniform. And it's just all too convenient to pass the blame on to the kind of outsider. But also, it's also easy to blame someone you don't really like. And because my great grandfather did question things, and you know, it's, it's in our it's in our genes. We all question things. All the Sosabosky males are like this. We don't suffer fools gladly. We're very direct about saying, "I think you're wrong," and that's exactly what he did say. You know, he was a soldier, but also he wasn't just going <clears> to <throat> be a sheep. He's going to say, "Well, look, I don't agree with this." I think it's strategically unsound, and he was right. So, and there's nothing worse than being right, of course. When yes, you, you proved right, when everything went wrong, it's let's just sort of um, take the wind out of yourselves a bit. Yes, sir. And that's the, to me, that's the best kind of commander, to be honest, one who's willing to say that something's foolish uh, before yes. lives are lost. One thing that I, I'm of the opinion as I've learned more about the battle, that an, an, an injustice was done to the Poles, even in Cornelius Ryan's book, or the, the film of Bridge 24, because a lot of people don't understand just how dramatic the evacuation of the 1st British Airborne Division was to, to cross the river, get away from Arnhem Bridge, and evacuate safely. And the Poles were actually given the mission of covering that retreat. The, la the last soldiers in contact, as I understand, came from the Polish Brigade, and they held their positions till the last to ensure that the, the, the British Division was able to effect its escape. Is that not correct? It is. And isn't that amazing? And after that, they said the Poles weren't keen to fight. You know, the, literally, the, the last to leave. Um, and I think that, that, that is one, an, yet another injustice upon the already many injustices. Um, injustices, I have to say, which the Dutch have mitigated. They granted um, my great-grandfather the Bronze Lion and um, to the Brigade, or what's now the, the Sixth Air Assault Airborne, the um, Order of the Willems Order, which is the Dutch, effectively the Dutch Victoria Cross, I think it's equivalent to your Congressional Medal of Honor. It's the highest um, award for bravery. 
the Poles, yes. um, as soon as um, Poland was decommunist, decommunized, um, my great grandfather was re instantly rehabilitated and um, he was awarded um, the Order of the White Eagle uh, three years ago. I went to collect that on my family's behalf, which again is, is, the, is the decoration right at the top. Um, it's a pity that the British can't do something along those lines. I'm not saying give me a medal because of course the people that don't deserve medals are the ones that ask for them, but something just to say we were wrong. This was not, this was not acceptable, especially with the British sense of alleged fair play that um, you don't besmirch someone's character and if you do, you then set it right at the earliest opportunity. Oh, yes, sir. And I, I've many Englishmen I consider good friends. I've served with them operationally. Uh, and I'll be honest, the more I've learned about the brigade and how uh, the general were treated, I, I, it surprised me greatly uh, because it didn't, didn't square with the men that I know personally and uh, their particular codes of honor. The thing that shocked me the most was uh, sort of the postscript because your great grandfather was relieved of command in the, the wake of the operation, correct? He was. What happened was um, when they came back, um, pressure was put by the British onto the Polish president in exile to um, remove him. And he was offered inspector in charge of salvage and disposal which he didn't accept. So he left, his men went on hunger strike, but he said, come on boys, we'll eat dinner together. And um, he left the garrison that day. He chose not to kiss the color because he said, I'm coming back. Um, at the end of the war, of course, Poland was um, under Stalin effectively under the Yalta conference. He wasn't able to go back to Poland. He had no pension and so had to try and work um, with his meager savings. He was a soldier, not a businessman, and so his businesses failed, and he ended up being a storeman in a factory. And many of his um, uh, soldiers were workers on the shop floor, so they would come to the stores and snap to attention and get what they needed. At the weekends, he was General Sosabowski, but he's not the only um, uh, Polish general to be in penury. I think it was General Maciek, and I will be corrected if double check this or ask the viewers to double check it. I think it was General Maciek. Yes, he was. He was a barman in Edinburgh after That's the war. That's amazing. A barman, you know? It's like everyone, someone's got to be a barman, but I don't know that um, a retired general should be humiliated in such a degree. Where, where's the justice? No, it was General Especially Maciek, one who contributed to a great victory and you know, helped their adopted nation, if you will, to uh, uh, you know, retain their independence. Yes. It's, it's, it's just a, a, a very sad tale, but I'm, I'm very th happy to hear that at least it, retroactively, the brigade's reputation is being rehabilitated. I have uh, nothing but uh, respect for this story and for these troopers and the, and the legacy that the sixth carries on today. That's for certain. Okay. But um, uh, the offer that I'll make to you and to your viewers is um, the, le the lectures, I've been developing it for 20 years, but if you've got um, potentially um, a night where you'd like to have a longer look at it, we can do the lecture uh, via you for your American brothers in arms because the lecture needs to be told. Um, you've seen it, so you can um, elucidate whether that's something that would be of appeal, but we could certainly look at doing that at um, an early date of your choice. Oh, that would be fantastic. I, I, I certainly f look forward to having you back soon and we, we can coordinate the, the logistics of that offline and we'll certainly look to be bringing that in uh, 2021. So uh, for anyone who is interested in learning more about the story before we can uh, have the professor back on to, to show his live lecture, I do wanna just point out that his, uh, his great grandfather did publish an autobiography. This is called Freely I Serve by Major General Stanislaw Sosabowski. It's available through uh, Pen and Sword Books. It's a fantastic story. Uh, not only was he a great hero of World War II, but he, uh, he fought during World War I. He was a professional soldier from, uh, from his youth. And it's just, a, it's an amazing tale of a professional soldier who uh, loved his country and loved his paratroopers. And so I highly recommend it. So uh, Professor Sosabowski, thank you so much for coming on this evening. I've uh, greatly enjoyed our time together. I uh, look forward to uh, strengthening our acquaintance in the future. I love your work. I love what you're doing. It's people like you that make sure that um, the young people don't forget what happened 70 odd years ago that we and what a debt that we owe. So I really do admire what you're doing. And you, we consider you a general, um, a genuine friend of Sosabowski. So thank you very much, Ben. Right, thank you, sir. You have a great evening. Okay.